Okay, good. So SimFactory is Cactus's tool for compiling um, Cactus on compute clusters and also on laptops. Um, it provides functionality of two kinds. One is to actually compile the code, um, but also to create and manage uh, simulations. Um, so it interacts with the queuing system and the resource manager in the system. The idea there is that it tries to abstract away the differences between different um, resource managers used by the different clusters and provide a uniform interface for all of these things. Um, and then I've put in the blurb basically from the uh, SimFactory main page um, that essentially says, well, actually running simulations on clusters is non-trivial um, and it's getting worse and worse with time to some extent. Um, maybe sometimes not always, um, you have to some degree a convergence of resource managers towards um, Slurm being the resource, resource manager of choice on all the modern clusters. But there definitely still is a variety of resource managers around that you have to worry about. So there's Slurm for sure. Um, but then there is PBS and its various descendants. Um, there is IBM's load leveler um, and uh, other managers around that um, um, are all a little bit different from what you would expect they would be. Um, so it turns out that Simulation Factory, as it's used today, that was not intended, uh, as it's used today, is not the first version, but instead it's version two. Um, which is a Python 3 by now application um, that re-implements the functionality of the original simulation factory that Eric Schnetter had written in Perl and was a bit of a different beast. Similar functionality, but very different setup. So it was a re-implementation, mostly more modularized, but also written in a language that's more modern than Perl. So whenever you're working with simulation factory, um, you kind of have to be aware how things are actually stored. So if you are a new user of the Einstein toolkit and you use the simulation factory, then you typically interact with SimFactory um, using its command interface, namely the sim command that comes with it. And then for example, um, what you would find in the tutorial, for example, would be the command to compile the Einstein toolkit code on pretty much any system, which is sim build minus minus storing list, Einstein toolkit.th, and then you can give it a name of a simulation uh, executable. In this case here, it's um, ETK. And this compiles Cactus configuration ETK um, using the own list um, Einstein toolkit or TH. And this line that's important is identical on every single system where SimFactory is supported. Um, so how does this then work? Clearly these systems are not all the same. There's different compilers, everything is different. So this is where the second part comes in. SimFactory isn't just a piece of software, but it's also an extensive machine database that exists in the MDB subdirectory of the SimFactory um, repository that you're checking out and also of the SimFactory directory in your Cactus checkout. And that one contains the information that describes the cluster to SimFactory and also contains fragments and templates of files that SimFactory uses to eventually submit a simulation to your cluster. There is basically uh, four files that make up a full description for a machine. The first one, in some level, the top level one, is the ini file, the machine description file that lives in the machine subdirectory. And as the name says, this is a standard, more or less, uh, Windows ini file, which has the, the usual syntax with um, sections um, headed by, print, by square bracket headers um, and comments and everything in there. And this describes the actual machine and also ties all of these four files together into one package that's in factory that manages. Um, turns out that this is kind of a global setting. You can always override individual settings and individual sections in that file using your users um, devs slash local dot any um, file. So that's a way to customize settings. If for example, um, you want a different username usually, um, or you want to store your software somewhere else, or you have a different allocation that has to go into your desktop local dot any. The other file that's, um, uh, used is what's called the option list, um, which is used to actually compile Cactus. And that turns out to be the standard Cactus configuration file, just as it is described um, in the configuration option section of the Cactus user guide. And I've linked this here, pretty much all the links that I'm providing are in actually what I'm talking about. So this isn't something that's nothing new, but it's provided in here and it's a large collection. You can use these independently of simulation factory if you don't want to use the other things. And then finally, there are two template files. Um, one that's called a submit script, 
and one that's called a run script in the respective subdirectories that are used to actually interact with the resource manager. And it's split in two for, I guess, historical reasons. The submit script is the actual file that you're giving to the resource manager directly. So that will be what you're passing to sbatch or um, qsub. It pretty much always looks the same. It has all the headers in there that describe how many nodes you want, how many cores, how long you want to run. And then there's usually exactly one line in that shell script that starts in factory and tells it to um, use the run command, then run the run script. And then command passes to the run script, which is basically the second half um, of the submit script. The only reason is that it gives SimFactory a chance in between um, to update some files and set some settings. Um, so these are the four files that make up a full SimFactory stuff. And the goal here is essentially, how do you create these four files um, on a cluster that you might be familiar with, but you haven't used SimFactory on yet? Right. So um, just pictorially, if you look at what the directory structure looks like, if say you had a machine foo, Oops. Then um, typically all of these files would have foo in the name. Um, you usually have foo.ini, which is the actual machine ini file. And then you have option lists, run scripts, and submit scripts that go along with it. Usually all more or less named the same, but the names are actually immaterial. And then just a flow code. All right. So, um, Roland, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Uh, so, so there's a sort of a paradigm that that well i guess i want to ask what's preferred so so when we got started with einstein toolkit we wanted to have one copy that got compiled once and it was sort of globally used among the group um that seemed awkward it seemed like the paradigm early is we all download our own copy and then we can do what we want with those Correct. is that right yes so the idea of the einstein toolkit um has always been that um, if you're downloading it you're most likely also going to write some code for it Therefore, you need your own um, chapter. Um, nowadays, it seems there are a fair number of groups that are using just the Einstein toolkit as it is um, released and um, provided with initial data and different parameter files and then run it. So for those groups, a binary um, package would actually be sufficient. But traditionally, this has not been the case. All right, so, um, and because you're starting from source code, uh, Setting up a SimFactory setup is not uh, a simple task and requires experience um, using clusters, as well as some understanding of how SimFactory works. In particular, um, setting up SimFactory on a cluster is quite a bit more complicated um, and quite a bit more complex than only compiling and submitting Cactus simulations using the example batch job scripts. Um, that the cluster admins might provide for you on their documentation page. So that's something to keep in mind. This is more complicated. If you are having trouble getting the cluster to work, first do that, then come back and set up SimFactory. Don't try to do everything at once, in particular if you're not experienced with it. Um, and then in the next paragraph, I'm basically linking to all the available documentation that exists for Simulation Factory, which is scattered all over the place. There is the actual user gu guide on the SimFactory homepage. Then there is the Simulation Factory Advanced Tutorial. Um, that's a, a wiki page on the Einstein Toolkit, as far as I know, or it's linked in the documentation page. And then there is the configuration, Configuring a New Machine Einstein Toolkit wiki page. Notice this is the same title as my talk. Um, that is in the Einstein Toolkit wiki that provides a lot of detail how to go about things. And these are the ones that you should study and that you will have to refer to. This tutorial here, really just gives you a bit of a, this is what I did on this particular cluster um, using the Cheyenne cluster at NCAR as an example. All right. So um, with this, this is kind of a running commentary. Um, I'll probably do about half of what I actually did in setting things up because I look at the recordings that I've taken of what I actually did and I'll probably cut them and make them available. And it took me something like four hours with a couple of hours of doing things and scratching my head in between. So I can't possibly cover everything there. But I'll cover the basic startup and then I'll probably cover the um, run script and the submit scripts because these are the more complicated ones. Um, and then the option list um, and the machine in the file um, is in the document, but I won't talk about it. So most important thing before you start, familiarize yourself with the cluster. 
um, find out what's the clusters documentation website. For Cheyenne, this is the one. Put this in some wiki somewhere you have access to. You have to refer to this thing all the time. Put it in the browser tab. Have this around. Um, get information how to log in. Uh, presumably, you rough, have a rough idea. You probably looked at the cluster before, but find out what that is. Um, get information what's the environment module system of the cluster. Usually, it's some sort of um, LMOD, but historically, there was something that's called soft ENV, which does the same thing with different commands. Find out how this works should be in the documentation. You should be familiar with a couple of commands that I'm listing. If you aren't, um, it's going to be that much harder. Um, locate information about the file system on the cluster. Basically, what's your home directory where you probably want the source code? Is it big enough? Um, what's the scratch directory where you probably want to run simulations? Is there a projects directory or a work directory which might be shared among um, groups, among members of the same group? that you can use to store larger data files. Or maybe you have to compile the code there because the home directory quota is puny at two gigabyte and you can't even compile the, the toolkit there. Find these out. Um, in the documentation, find out how to compile sample code. Um, doesn't have to be the Einstein toolkit, use the example. In fact, um, find an MPI Hello World code that just prints Hello World, I provide two links for this, so that you can compile that code and run their demo batch script to see if it actually works. These things also tell you if the threading is done correctly. So these are useful diagnostic tools. Um, um, finally, definitely go and hunt for their sample batch job submission scripts. You will want these. These are much more useful than the tens of pages of documentation that you're typically being provided. If they have a sample, use that one. Um, so you definitely want that. Okay, so that's the information gathering stage. Once you have that, um, make sure that the current development version of the Einstein toolkit, which is what you've been working with, actually compiles on your laptop. So that in case things actually fail to compile on the cluster, you know it's the cluster and it's not a bug in the Einstein toolkit. These are preliminaries. I know it sounds redundant, but <laughs> if you do this in advance, you save yourself a lot of work, or at least you're aware that this is the information that you need. All right, with that, um, it kind of becomes a mixture of um, shell input and shell output with a bit of a description in between. So here, first thing, log into the cluster. This is Cheyenne, um, Cheyenne, you credit edu, my username, a two-factor authentication, and then I'm in. Turns out that if I look at the documentation page, Cheyenne's home directory is 50 gigabytes in size. Um, it's not purged, so that makes it a good place to store my source code. There's also a work directory um, for me to stage my data. There's a project directory for the group, and there is a scratch directory on top of everything else where I can actually run my simulations. So I've got a plethora of options, but I'm just going to use the home directory because the login script drops me off there. Um, so, now you have to set things up. Normally when we say you are you want to run Cactus on a cluster, you download it on your laptop and then you sim factor to copy to the laptop, uh, to the workstation, to the cluster. Here, you can't do that because sim factor doesn't know about the cluster. So you have to download um, the Einstein toolkit directly on the cluster. Shouldn't be a problem. You can usually just use the download instructions that you find on the Einstein toolkit website. And these are literally copied from there. Run curl to get get components, make get, make get components executable get the current Einstein toolkit checkout. This should all work. Um, if it doesn't work because you're missing Git or Subversion, then you probably have to load a module to get them. There is a module avail command that you can use to show all the available modules that you could load. That's something you'll need. Some clusters also are really annoying and don't let you access anything on the internet. If that's a cluster that you're on, consider using a different cluster. If you're stuck with that cluster, <laughs> um, you have to download on your laptop and then use rsync to copy to the cluster. Again, this is something you need to know. Um, and also, um, it's probably useful to commit your changes that you make to the files into the checked out Git repository right away. So you want to set up Git correctly um, to give it a, an author name and an author email. These are somewhat optional. If you don't set them, then Git warns you about they're not being there and tells you exactly what to do when you first commit. But this now gets you a checked out version of the Einstein toolkit. And if everything works, you should have the regular output from get components 
um, with a couple of hundred components checked out, none failed, and hopefully it takes about a minute or so. so. Um, with this, you basically have a setup that looks a lot similar to what you have on your laptop. So let's go ahead. Let's go into the Einstein Toolkit, uh, Cactus Checkout, and we are here. And now the first thing to do is to check if SimFactory by some miracle already knows about your cluster, or maybe it misidentifies the cluster as something else. SimFactory has a command, command who am I, which actually tells you not who you are, it tells you what the machine you are on. And if you run this on a cluster that's unknown, such as Cheyenne, um, it'll output two warnings saying that there's an unknown machine. Um, Cheyenne6.cheyenne.ucar.edu. This is good. This is the host name um, of the login node or one of the login nodes of Cheyenne as SimFactory sees it. That's information that's good to know. Um, take note of this. And then it will say current machine is none. It's saying that it doesn't recognize the system. This is expected. It's the new cluster. Maybe you're lucky somebody set it up. You just didn't know about it. Then it would be identified here. It's also possible that it misidentifies the machine, um, in which case, um, this paragraph here applies. Essentially, things get identified based on regular expressions, based on the host name that's reported. Somebody put in a regular expression that's too lenient and matches one more than one cluster. You have to go and change that, and the paragraph explains how to do that. Not the case in Cheyenne, though. All right. So now we've downloaded the code. We've checked some factory doesn't know about it. We've got a reasonably sane setup. Um, Setting up things on a new cluster doesn't normally mean that you start from scratch. I really advise against doing so. You always want to um, start with copies of files for other clusters they didn't modify. So there's four files you need. So we'll make four copies of existing files from different clusters. Um, which ones to pick uh, is a bit of an art. You usually want to pick some, some that are somewhat similar. Um, it's probably best to pick something where the queuing system and ideally the compiler is the same as what you're using. On Cheyenne, um, one can find out that, in fact, the queuing system is uh, a PDS flavor. That's in the documentation. And um, it um, happens to use the Intel compiler. We'll find late, that later. So we want to use a PBS system. And to do that, you can look for, say, the string PBS in, sorry, in the submit scripts because PBS is the leader for the PBS comments in the submit script, so it's unique to find that. You can use grep to find all the submit scripts here that contain the word PBS. And then I'll put just a file name with the minus L option. If you run this, you'll find there aren't that many, maybe half a dozen candidates that still use PBS. Um, in my case, since I'm most familiar with Blue Waters, and I know it's one of the more modern, uh, more modern set of option lists, not the modern systems, but more modern option lists, I picked Blue Waters. So I'll base my submit script on Blue Waters. Um, I'll probably also then try to use a machine ini file that's based on Blue Waters because the machine ini file has to match the submit script, has to match the run script. So it's good to pick them all from the same. If I can, I'll deviate from that occasionally. So you want to start with this, start with a copy. So make a copy of the existing submit script, do waters.sub, name it um, anything you want, really. But it's traditional to name it after the short name of the cluster. So if the cluster is called Cheyenne, um, you may want to call the name, the, the submit script, Cheyenne.sub. Don't put the full URL in there. It has way too many dots. It's way too long. The important thing, how SimFactory actually identifies the cluster, isn't actually the name of the file, but instead it's the section header of the ini file um, that's in there. And that ini file then actually tells the file name of the submit script to use and the file name of the run script to use. So if you look at the actual file, you'll find that there is a kind of macro parameters. Um, surrounded in ampersand, uh, in at signs. And these are used by SimFactory to inject information about um, the run into your template files. Um, they always have the at signs around them. They are always uppercase. Um, there is some attempt of getting a list of them, 
in the documentation, but there is no central place and it's really best to just start from a working example and modify that. They are scattered all over the source code and there's no central documentation about them. Um, I've given the links of the documentation again, so you can see where these might be defined. All right, so enough getting started. This is the first file we want to modify. Um, and it took us a while to get there. You can see I'm somewhat something like one third through my slides. And that's just because it takes a while to set things up. So mid script isn't too bad though. So I could go line by line through the individual changes that you have to make. I'm not sure if that's such a good idea, at least for the submit script, I can make it more easily by showing you a diff. So you've copied the file, open the file in an editor um, to see what's in there. You will have to make changes for all the things to match the different clusters. Thankfully, um, if the queuing system is similar, as it is in this case, there aren't so many changes. Here, um, should put in a link, um, it turns out that what you often need to change is whatever option um, are used to deal um, with the node allocations. That's usually some specific to each cluster. So that's um, minus L nodes on Blue Waters and minus L select on Cheyenne. These you should be able to read out out of their sample batch submission scripts or out of the documentation but they are cluster specific. There is no standard way of specifying this, certainly not for PBS, um, somewhat more standardized for Slurm, but not exactly unique and standardized there either. So you always have to look up the documentation and you always have to look up the, uh, the batch job submission script examples, unfortunately. If you know, <clears throat> Look at the difference between what I had before. So Blue Waters versus Cheyenne. You can see there aren't that many differences. There's basically a difference in how the user is selected. Minus Q is the Q option for PBS. And then you just give the name for um, Cheyenne, which is normal. And then Blue Waters had that funny complicated construct here which you can ignore because we are making things easier. But you can see there is an obvious change. There's also a change, unsurprisingly, in how one specifies the nodes, how much resources you want. You go from nodes equals something to select equals something. And I'll have a paragraph showing what, what might be useful there in a second. These are basically copied from the examples that they have with a bit of introspection. There is no real way that I can tell you how to do this. This is like asking me, how do I solve a mathematical problem? I can give guidelines, you develop intuition, you try something, it fails, you try again. Um, and then just standard options for PBS that you could look up from the example or from the man page to specify the email address where to send information to. And then there's a specific option to actually write the standard out and standard error files on Cheyenne that's not required on Blue Waters. It's in the example, I really mostly copy them. What's interesting for you is most certainly um, what kind of variables exist for the nodes, the processors or cores per node, what queues, how many MPI ranks to create per node, how many threads, OpenMP threads to use and so on. Depending on what cluster you're using, what queuing system they use, they want to have the information specified in different ways. Some want nodes, some want cores, some want MPI ranks, some don't care. So there's a variety that SimFactory has to support. Um, the user's guide lists the ones that are used. Um, Ian Hinder did a very good job of collecting all that information and documenting what it is. He has a nice table that I'm reproducing here that shows you what all of these individual variables mean. So these you can use to construct things. And if everything else fails, um, you can do math. Um, with that funny um, operator that you see here, which is basically um, a Python expression evaluator inside of the outermost set of parentheses. I wouldn't really want to use it too much because it's tricky and finicky. But that's basically the most complicated thing that you probably have to do. If you have any questions on how to set this up, please ask now because these are the complicated parts. In particular, 
this one line is where all the headaches are. Everything else is fairly standard. This is the headache. Roland, do I also understand though, at the end, I've set something up with these scripts. As a user, I can always say sim, submit, and change those options. Is that true, I think? Correct. Yeah. Um, a lot of these are directly what the user specifies. Um, not quite all of them, a lot of them are. Um, so num threads is exactly your num threads option on the command line. Um, then the prox variable is exactly the minus minus prox or minus minus cores or whatever is the flavor of the day of the name of that option, which is actually the total number of threads to use. Usually this is the number of hardware cores because we don't use hyperthreading, but if you're using hyperthreading, then it actually is the number of logical threads that the operating system sees, the number of logical cores if you want to. How these then get translated to options into the submit script is a different story. Because sometimes the clusters will count hyperthreads, sometimes they count um, log uh, physical cores. All right, any other question on this? I know this was really, really quick, but it turned out at least for this particular pair of clusters, there wasn't much to change. Okay. Then the other half um, of the pair of submit script and run script that you will need to actually run the cluster is the run script. So while the submit script essentially has just headers with the various um, PBS or SBatch options. And then there's usually exactly two lines of code, one that um, CDs to the sim factory directory and the other one that says sim factory run um, to actually then run the simulation explicitly. The run script is everything else. Um, so if you look at an example batch submission script, that's basically the lower two thirds of the example file that they give you. Um, it has the same um, um, expansion parameters available that the submit script has. Uh, sometimes there are some in there that can only be used in the run script and not in the submission script. For example, in the submit script, you can't do substitutions yet for the job ID because at the time that the script is used, you don't know the job ID yet, but in the run script you do. So there is an extra level of information you could use. Anyhow, um, since the two are a pair, we have to basically use the run script from the waters for Cheyenne. At least that's the traditional wisdom. Turns out that in my case, it wasn't quite so much true, but in principle, this would be the thing to do because usually these things are all tied together, run scripts and everything else. So again, um, you would open them up in an editor to, to look what's in there. These tend to be a little bit longer, but they are just a regular bash script that gets executed, not a Z shell script, usually a bash script and SimFactory explicitly runs bash, not your login shell, bash. Um, so there's a glitch here. Um, Blue Waters is a craze system and all the craze systems look identical to each other, but completely different from anything else in the world. So in the end, it doesn't look quite so useful in the end. Um, Cheyenne is sufficiently different. On the other hand, Cheyenne, um, uses OpenMPI, at least in my case, as the um, MPI stack and PBS to run things. So um, I looked around a little bit and got myself the right cluster. First though, um, you have to find out if you're using MPI, what's the proper MPI run command? That should be in the example batch submission script files that they provide you with. Um, sometimes it's a bit finicky in that you need to provide a particular path or have the modules loaded or whatnot. In that case, um, you should go ahead and yourself load the module in a test environment. So what I typically do is I start myself a new shell. That means everything that I do now is in that subshell. If I kill that subshell, I'm back to my original environment and I haven't accidentally changed my environment in ways that I can't really reproduce. You can then run the load command to load the proper module. Open MPI 405 in this case, and then for example, find out um, 
where does the MPI run executable lives. If this does not happen to live in a path that looks like the proper module files, if it doesn't have open I in it, open MPI in it, you can suspect that the um, cluster admins have been clever and written their own MPI run wrappers, which you then have to study because they probably did all kinds of wrong things in there. You can also try and run MPI run minus minus version to find out exactly what's the MPI run that runs and that better matches what you think it is. So if you loaded open MPI 405, then you run the version command and it reports that it's MPI run for mpitch. Something is deeply wrong because it's running the wrong MPI run. Or if it reports MPI run 3.x, that's also wrong. It needs to match the same version number. So that's sanity checks to make sure you have the right one. Um, if everything is okay, just go out of your shell, exit, and you're back where you started. At least you know things are now correct. <clears throat> so turns out that in my case, it was easier to start from a different cluster, the Golub cluster um, at NCSA, which also uses PBS um, and also uses OpenMPI and actually also happens to use, I think, the Intel compiler. So that actually is a better fit for me because it's a white box cluster. Exactly which one to pick, who knows, um, but it's one of the clusters that were listed in my output for GAP. Um, the differences are a little bit more extensive. They're not too bad, but they are there. So here I'm comparing the run script for Golub, in fact, with the run script for Cheyenne. So you can see that I had to go back and forth and change things a bit. Um, it's pretty much all standard. You can always just copy it. Um, you can see that I'm explicitly calling bash, but I think it doesn't even matter because we're passing it as an argument to a bash script. And other than that, um, it's just standard stuff. Um, PBS doesn't by default drop you in any useful directory. It drops you in the home directory. So you very often have to do something like CD to the place where you actually want to run in there. So that's what I had to add. Then it's often useful to make a copy of the actual node list file that was given to you by SimFactory or by the queuing system actually. Um, and PBS normally sets up an environment variable. PBS node file, that's the path of that file. Exactly how to get to this is again, resource manager specific. You would have to read the documentation of the resource manager in question. Um, not everything is created equal. There's multiple things that are PBS. There is the ancient um, public open source PBS system. And then there's various commercial derivatives of it that all say they are PBS, but probably work a little bit different. This particular variable you can hope exists because it's so common. Um, and that's basically the only change that I've made. You can see that in this line, um, I've uncommended a little bit of an extra line to make sure that all the environment variables that are in use get written to a file called environment in the sim factory subdirectory of the actual run directory. So that's in particular useful when you get started. You can see exactly what were the variables available and do they match to what I think they should be. Say 90% of the time, you won't look at that file, but in the 10% that you do look at it, it's useful and 1% is probably crucial and it doesn't cost anything, it's a kilobyte. So again, the trick here is don't do this from scratch. This file has, uh, I don't know, maybe at least two dozen lines, not too bad but writing them from scratch is still error prone. Much easier to pick an existing file and modify that. So Roland, was there any reason, would, would there be any reason that once you found Golub for a run script, you'd say, oh, maybe I should have used Golub, Golub for the submit script too and go back and check things like that. Or once you no, had a decent submit script, you're done with that. You're pretty much done. I mean, you can compare them. Um, um, and you would find that the Blue Waters one is pretty much similar to the Golub one because they're mm -hmm. all descendants of each other. Um, these are just the two that I'm familiar with Blue Waters because while well, I work there and Golub is also because it's at NCSA, but anything else would work. Particularly the, the submit scripts, they all pretty much look the same. If you want know the queuing system you're on, they're pretty much the same because they really just have the blur of headers and then they say run off the run script. Right, so those are basically the two most complicated ones that you have to set up. 
And if you are careful and pick a cluster description that's similar to what you want to run on, then they're not too bad. So um, I have a little bit more time than I had expected. Maybe I was going too fast. Um, I can cover one more file. Um, and I think, well, let me see what I have here. We should cover the option script, option list over the, the machine file. So let me cover the option list, I guess. They're both not too bad, but they are of course very specific to the machine. So let me scroll up again. So we've covered two out of the four files that we need to handle. Um, the next one is the option list, which is in fact, just the same thing as a Cactus configuration file for um, the Cactus framework. So in principle, all documentation is available there. Um, and it's in some sense, just a matter of filling in the blanks. Again, um, you want to start with a system that's similar to what you're using. Here, you want to make sure that it's similar with respect to compiler and MPI stack. The queuing system doesn't matter because Cactus actually doesn't know about the queuing system. So you want to make sure the, inter com the compiler matches and the MPI stack matches. How do you find which ones are in use? Well, in the submit script, I already guessed what they are. But in fact, the real thing to do is you run the module list command when you're freshly logged in, haven't done anything else, that lists all the environment modules that are, that are loaded. And typically there's default selected. Um, and you can look at them and see what they are. So if I run this, you would find that the Intel compiler is the default compiler that's being used. And then if you look at this, um, to me, it looked there was no MPI stack loaded. That happens every once in a while. And then I looked and picked the open MPI one. Um, turns out MPT is in fact an MPI um, stack. It's the um, HP Enterprise MPI stack, not the Cray one, HP Enterprise, um, which is the default. And I just unload that one but I should have probably used that one. It's usually best, at least when you start to pick the default compiler and the default MPI stack, because that's probably the only one that was really extensively tested by the admins. So if you pick this, at least you stand a chance that the other modules might also work with this. If you pick something exotic, um, the PGI compiler, so chances are things are not going to work. Anyway, so, <coughs> Um, I'll skip the next section here. Um, right. So now you have to, again, play the game, find a good place to start from. I want the Intel compiler. The Intel compiler can be identified by its name. It's usually ICPC, Intel C++ compiler. Um, and you want OpenMPI as the MPI stack because that's the one that I randomly picked also a portable one, so it's maybe not such a bad choice. Um, you can find out which ones are available by running the module avail command, which usually is a long list and shows you everything that's there. Then which option list to pick? Eh, who knows? In some sense, if you knew all the options, you can pick the right one. If not, you can look at the file names and make a guess. In my case, a good guess is sheetup-openmpi because I know the cluster is in use. It's the same as the mic cluster at LSU. It has open MPI in the name, which is great. And if you look at the file, it actually has the Intel compiler in there. So that's a good match. That's the starting point. We'll still extensively modify it, but at least we don't start from scratch. So pick this one. Make a copy. Uh, where did I go? I'm sorry, I moved around. I shouldn't edit, edit things. Yeah. Make a copy of the option list, then edit it again. This is going to be much, much longer than the others. Um, a lot of it is more or less boilerplate. We are trying to make them more uniform so that they all look more or less the same. Um, some of the options should be fairly straightforward. Um, there is the CPP C preprocessor, which you usually can just leave at CPP. The FPP processor, that's CPP as used by the Fortran compiler. Same thing usually, just CPP. And then CC, CXX, and F90 are the C, C++, and Fortran compiler to use. That should be um, 
just the standards for the compiler that you want to use. You should know what they're called. Um, with GNU, they're GCC, G++, and GFortran. With Intel, they're ICC, ICPC, and IFORT. But these are compiler specific. Whichever compiler is on the cluster, um, either the admins will tell you or you have to play around with it. No much else you can do. Um, there's one tricky piece. There's a variable called FPP flags, which you must set. If you don't, you get really strange errors, in particular if you're set not setting FPP. You always set FPP flags to at least include the word minus minus traditional. This is such that the CPP preprocessor behaves as the pre ANCC um, preprocessor, which is what some parts of our Fortran build system assume. If you don't, you're going to get really strange error messages from the Fortran compiler. Always put these in. Um, it's really confusing if you get the error messages. You can leave everything out. You can leave out FPP and FPP flex. That's fine. Then there's a default. If you specify either one of the two, you have to specify FPP flex and you have to have traditional in there. Um, most of the other flags that are of the form of foo flags, so C flex, CXX flex, and so on and so forth, uh, can usually be okay, or you can try and update them based on the compiler, on the vendor, yeah, on the cluster admins documentation on how to compile code. And I'm linking to the compile document. See, this is where we're using all of these information we collected. Um, it's pretty much a fill in the blanks because you know the basic structure. Um, you want to make sure you select um, C99 as the language feature for the C++ compiler. Usually for C, for Intel and GNU compiler, this is minus standard equals GNU 99. And C++ 11 for the C++ compiler. Otherwise, um, probably our Cactus configure script will bail out and will say you need at least those versions. So save yourself some trouble, put it in there. You also have to enable um, what's called crate pointers on the Fortran side of things. These are kind of ancient attempts of adding uh, C-like pointers to Fortran, but they are widely supported by the Fortran compilers. And in fact, they're in some sense more useful than the, uh, than the actual Fortran pointers that were developed afterwards. Peter may yell at me now. Um, exactly what option you use depends on the class, on the compiler for um, intern compiler, it's called minus safe cray pointer. Um, I think the GNU compiler has them one by default, but that's also an option. If you pick the proper template, it will be in there. Um, right. Specifically for the Intel compiler, and that has tripped up people at least two or three times, these compilers do use the GNU C++ compiler's standard C++ template library. Always. Um, but they have to match. Uh, if you use a library that's too old, you're not going to get all the C++ standard template library features we need. If you pick one that's too new, the compiler just aborts because it doesn't know how to use it. Should be set up correctly by the cluster admins. Sometimes it's not, in particular, if they have very many Intel compilers available. Um, but the Intel compiler has an option minus minus GXX name, which you can pass a G++ compiler, so the new compiler executable, and then it will pick the standard C++ library that belongs to that compiler. And that's way more easy than all the other options that they offer. And that way you can tell it to use a particular one. Uh, typically anything with G++ larger than six should be good and should be supported by all compilers you're likely to encounter. Um, don't pick the very newest one. Um, sometimes these are not supported by the Intel compiler then it bails out. Too new is usually a better error message than too old. Too old just gives you crazy error messages. Uh, so this is one thing that's specific for the Intel compiler. One more thing that you may have to take into account, in particular if you're not used to um, Cactus, but it's Cactus specific, not really SimFactory, is that our code is a mixed code, compiles both C++ and Fortran code that are in the same executable, which means that when we actually bind everything together into a single executable, we have to use the um, C++ compiler wrapper because you need to initialize constructors and only that wrapper will do so. But we also have to include the Fortran runtime library to make sure that the Fortran print call, for example, works. Um, some compilers are clever enough to do that for you. Many aren't, in which case you specify in lips 
the library name of the Fortran support library. Which one that is depends on the cluster. For the Intel compiler, it's called IF core, Intel Fortran core library. For G Fortran, it's called G Fortran from libg Fortran. If you have any other compilers, um, you're on your own. Cray cloud compilers do it automatically. So Cray systems, you don't have to worry about. Um, that's basically it. There's other odds and ends that I'm mentioning in here, such as the Intel compiler com um, optimizing by default. So you have to tell explicitly how do you turn this off? It's always O0, so you have to tell it. Um, and then a glitch for BLAST and LAPAC. So those two are linear algebra libraries um, that some code in the Einstein toolkit uses. Intel compiler comes with its very own version of that called the math kernel library. That's part of the compiler package. So it's integrated to the compiler in some sense. It knows about it. It has special syntax how to use it. it makes your life easier um, in the sense of that you only have to pass an option minus MKL to the compiler, a linker and everything, and then it magically works. Of course, this doesn't look at all like a library to link against. It's some crazy compile time option, but you can pass that to our Cactus configuration options as usual. If you pick a template file, it's probably already in there. But the trick is for blast lips, you give minus MKL as the library name. And our build system is smart enough to not um, mangle this. And then to tell the compiler to not compile anything at all for this um, linear algebra library, set blast there to no build. This means it's not going to go into a hike and search for it or trying to compile it from source. And the very same thing for LAPAC. So these are a bit tricky um, because you kind of have to know exactly how the internals of the Cactus build system work and how the external libraries work, how the Intel compiler works, and all of this. So this can be really confusing where on earth this might work. So I'm mentioning it here. Right. Um, then I have issues at least on Cheyenne in the sense of that this all compiles. And then if you run, it complains that at runtime it can't find the proper library, which is annoying. This typically means that um, it's missing what's called an art path, um, a dynamic runtime path to look for the libraries. You can tell at link time where to look for libraries at runtime um, using an art path option, the highlighted one here, um, to the actual linker then there is a bit of a syntax to pass that one to the proper linker. You set in the ldflex environment variable, which is passed to the compiler wrapper, which then takes a minus w argument to pass options to the actual linker, separated by commas, the option name our path, oops. And then the path to the MKL directory has to go in there where you want to find the libraries. What that is, it tends to be about this long, um, and not particularly intuitive, but you can usually find out what it is. In fact, what you do and what's really often very useful is you can use the module show command on the module of the Intel compiler that's currently being loaded. That's loaded. So module list tells you the name of the modules loaded. Module show kind of tells you the contents of that module description file. That's the output. Um, it's um, a mixture of kind of textual information um, and actual TCL code to tell the truth. But what's interesting here is you can see that there is a couple of these prepend path and path type, type settings that it does. One of them is for LD library path and one of them is for path. So this tells you where you would find the Intel compiler um, installed in the system. So here it would be Glade, U, apps, opt Intel 2020U1 compiler and libraries, Linux, lib, Intel 64. And everything from compiler and libraries is basically the standard stuff that Intel always lays out their things. So in <clears throat> our case, um, there will be many more such lines. Um, sometimes you're lucky, one of them is called MKL root or MKL home or something similar, this is probably a good one to start. Um, if not, you have to guess. For MKL, you're looking for 
a subdirectory mkl, usually somewhere in there. And then inside of that, the lib intel64 subdirectory. And you just have to know that this is where the libraries that it's looking for are located. If you want to, you can also pick that path, the name of the library that it complains about, and run the find command to find files by the, with that name in there. Works can be slow. So this is basically fixing errors that you might see. And as usual, fixing errors is a bit of an art. Um, are there any questions on this? Are you familiar with the module show command? If not, it's really useful. Okay. So what you will find is that the option list also has settings for the various external libraries, usually of the form of foo underscore dir. And since you're modifying the file already, you might just as well consult module avail to find out what kind of other libraries does the cluster provide for you that you can then use of the module system rather than having to compile it yourself. Um, so in my case, I would find that there is an FFTW 3.3.8 um, module available for FFTW3, which I can use here. Um, and the setup is very similar to what we did for MKL. Basically, you run module show on the module you've just loaded. That spits out all kinds of information, typically enough for you to understand what's the library directory, what's the include directory, and maybe what's the base directory as well. So this is where you get the information that you then have to transfer into the um, option list. Whenever you load a module to compile something, you have to make sure that SimFactory does so for you when you run. That actually goes into the ENV setup option of the machine in the file that we haven't talked about yet. So you can see you have to kind of go back and forth to make sure that all the pieces that mesh together actually work. Um, ENV setup is just a long shell, script, shell command. Um, and each line typically looks something like module load, name of the module, oops, name of the module, and then I tend to end them with two ampersands so that all these module load commands get chained together by the shell, and then the error code propagates outwards. And if any one of them fails, SimFactory can tell and can abort the run. Uh, that's pretty much it. I don't really think I'm going to go into more details here. You can read this thing just as well to see the differences. So there is nitty gritty things you have to take care of. Usually if you start from a template, it's mostly taken care for you. All right, <clears throat> one more diff um, and then I think I'm out of time. So this is the difference um, between my starting point, Shilop, and what I ended up with for Cheyenne. Um, you can see this is much longer but it's mostly just replace values of, of, of variables. I'm not adding anything new usually. I'm not uh, removing anything. I'm just changing values. A lot of them are yeah, just text. Version is just a text. These are the various compiler names. You can see I'm making these shorter. Um, I have the various flags. Sometimes diff gets confused. FPP flags is here and here. And it's in fact the same thing. It's just diff that gets confused. Um, and you can see some of them got simpler. My LD flags have our path in there for MKL. Uh, MKL is here. And I believe this might have just been for, G, for IF core or so. You can see I'm setting my IF core library here. And then mostly everything else doesn't really change, right? So a large block here is missing. I'm going from line 27 to line 75 without making any changes really. So about 50 lines of gunk that I'm just taking. Um, obvious stuff, Shilop has GPUs, Cheyenne does not. At least I'm not using them, so I removed those options. Same down here. You can see another thing goes away. Um, and then I have some of these options that are being set, uh, it intersperses them a bit. I tried to keep them alphabetically sorted, but it's basically all things like give the directory, 
put in the path that I've gleaned from the module show command. There isn't really rocket science in there. You just have to go through and see what's requested, see if there's a module that looks like a good match, load the module, run module show, get the path, put it in there. So nothing specifically complicated. Um, you can see that for MPI libs, I'm also putting them in. These, I believe, you can mostly leave out because Steve Brand did a very good job of adding auto detection for the MPI options. But on a cluster, which doesn't change, you can often just do it by hand. Again, what, the, what these names are is to some extent something you have to know. You can copy it from other ones, um, but it's not too different. Usually for open MPI, it's one set. For the Intel MPI stack, it's a different one. For MPitch, it's a different one. And then for the Cray compilers, it's included anyway. You don't have to put anything there. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's the end of what I have time for to talk about. And you can see I got maybe through half of what I have. And even that is already condensed. But I hope at least it gives you an idea what's the general way of how to go about this. Um, and you can read through the whole thing um, in that link. I've also put it on my binder, but you can also look at it. And what I will do um, in the weekend or so, I will actually take the recording that I've taken of me setting it up on Cheyenne. I'll edit it a little bit to um, take out um, starts and stops and maybe where somebody calls me on the phone. And then I'll make these also available. They are not linear in the sense of they actually show you what I did. And I explained this to a student of mine, what I did, and I go through, and it takes me about four hours to set the whole thing up. But it's exactly what I've typed, and it's exactly what I've done, including all the false starts. And that might show you, to some extent, what a real-life situation looks like. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Thanks, Roland. Very helpful. Actually, I say that a little quickly. I think it'll be very helpful. Once I start trying this on our cluster, I may come back to you with more questions. I have a question. So uh, where is this recording going to be uh, of the seminar? So where, where can we find it in the... Uh, there's a seminars page of the Einstein Toolkit home, homepage. Um, Basically, einsteintoolkit.org slash seminars. OK, so it's going to be there. Yep. OK, thank you. Uh, we might also link it. I think we have also have a section on the wiki where we say tutorials or so. We might just as well link it there as well and lectures. I think it's good enough to go there. And I also have a question if there is time. Uh, so on many clusters, I had problems uh, compiling. I don't know what's the name, PA, PI, Papi, whatever is, is the name. And I, I've seen that some option files actually exclude the foreign at all. And uh, so I tried to figure out what it does and I grabbed inside the source code and I couldn't find any instance in which this uh, thorn is being used. So my question is, do I need it? Uh, or, uh, and yeah, because many classes don't provide it for some time, like it's difficult to compile it. Yeah, on, on Linux clusters, it should normally work, um, but yeah, it can be tricky. Um, you don't need it. Um, Papi adds performance counters that can be used um, by uh, Carpet and the uh, timer output in Cactus so that you can, for example, get information how many flops are done in particular functions, how many cache misses do you have. Um, nothing relies on it, and it can't because you can't compile this thing on Mac OS, for example. So if it gives you trouble, you can leave it out. The only things you really, really need are basically MPI, HD5, GSL. And that's what you would need for typical setups. A lot of the others are good to have, but not really required. Some of them you can just build by hand. Um, if you have MPI and a compiler, pretty much everything can be compiled outside of the, from the Einstein toolkit and the external libraries. Um, things. Some things I don't really bother a whole lot with. Um, Petsy, I don't bother so much because I don't use it myself and it's a pain to build. Um, but there are some people who want it and use it. Same with FFTW. Um, it's used by the Pitnall code, um, but not by much else, I think. Um, so 
there's a question um, if I can comment on AVX and how one would use it, I guess. So AVX is a vector instruction extension for Intel compilers, um, one of the older ones by now. Um, and that one usually um, reflects, gets reflected in a option to the compiler where you tell it what architecture to target. So I'm not sure if I have that visible in my screen. Um, I think it doesn't even show up. So uh, I guess it usually would show up in the optimize flags where you show um, which compiler architecture to compile for. Um, for Intel compilers, this is usually something called minus X and then you give it a particular name that describes the architecture, which one you have to look up either from existing option lists or from the Intel compiler documentation. <clears throat> if you know that your login nodes are the same as the compute nodes, um, then there is a specific option called minus X host, which makes the compiler figure out what it's running on and compile for that architecture. That might be easy. For the GNU compiler, the same option is called um, minus M arc, one word. And then you give it the name of the architecture that you want to compile for again. Again, the specific list is dependent on the compiler. It's available on the GNU compiler documentation page. And I'll probably go in and I'll put in the information about where you can find these two pages for the Intel compiler and for the GNU compiler in there that you can find them. It also has an option that corresponds to X host. It's called native. And it does the same thing. It looks at the architecture of the host it's running on and it uses that to compile. Really only works if your login node is the very same as the compute nodes. It means the very same. You can't even go from Broadwell to Haswell. You can't even go from Intel Skylake um, with the AVX 512 instructions to now it's landing with the AVX 512 instructions. In fact, that one is technically a cross compile. So it really has to be the same system or at the very least the same generation and everything. And sure, it makes no difference if you're going from a two gigahertz machine to a three gigahertz machine from workstation, uh, from login node to compute node, but the same architecture. Does that answer the question at all? Okay. I have a very quick question. So in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, to, to use the examples that the documentation of the cluster gives you for the run script. Uh, but uh, usually they provide you hybrid or non-hybrid examples and all that. So which one you should use? The hybrid one always or, or it depends? The on... Always the hybrid one. You want a hybrid MPI OpenMP um, example because that's what Cactus is. It uses MPI across nodes and then open MP on a node and you want that one. Okay, thank you. So oh, I have a quick question. How, how do you set up the alias pattern from, uh, uh, from where you mentioned that you have the login node name and then how do you set up in the machine file? Give me a second. So it's in the document, of course, um, machine file. So your alias pattern. So the alias pattern is in the machine ini file and the section up here would explain how, how to create it basically, or again, copy it. Don't start from scratch, copy it from a cluster. In this case, the blue waters one is a good one because the queuing system is blue waters. Um, and then the alias pattern is a regular expression that should match the login node host names and of the machine you're on and only of the machine that you're on. So if you still have it, the output of our initial sim factory bin sim who am I was good because it gave us the host name. In my case, that host name was given as Cheyenne six, um, there's a dot missing, um, dot Cheyenne dot ucar dot edu. And you have to turn that into what looks like a regular expression that might match all of what likely is the, ho the login host names that you're going to find. So the important thing is start with an anchor at the beginning to, and uh, a dollar sign at the end to make sure it matches the whole string, not just the substring, just in case there is something else that looks very similar. And then you have to turn things into regular expression, which means dots need to get escaped by a backslash. And then you make an educated guess if you have a number or so that is at the end of the login name, 
then chances are there are going to be login names um, one, two, three, four, five. Exactly how many there are, you never quite know. Um, but again, chances are maybe there's more than 10, maybe there isn't. Uh, maybe they start from zero, maybe they don't start from zero. In my case with Cheyenne, I kind of made an educated guess and assumed, eh, there's not going to be more than nine. So I'm just going to put in a regular expression that matches the single digits from one to nine. So you have to construct a regular expression that matches well enough. Don't put in something that just says login one, login two, login three, and nothing afterwards, um, because that's too generic. And then you can test this. Um, once you have that, um, you can try and see if everything works. You can now again run um, who am I, and this now should output for you the proper um, machine name. It should identify the machine based on the name and then report to you the name that you've chosen in the section name of the any file. Does that answer the question? Thank you. 